when I was thinking about the title for this talk, I, I thought when my daughters used to come home sometimes from school, they would tell me their friends when they asked then their friends asked them what their dad used to do, and they used to say, you know, he's involved with mushrooms, he does something with mushrooms. And their <laughs> friends got really excited <laughs> until they had to explain to them it wasn't that type of mushroom <laughs> that I was involved with. And what I used to say to them, really, you know, I know there are some mushrooms that we tend to think of as magic mushrooms, but really, for me, and I think for all of us, all mushrooms are magic. They are probably one of the most under under-exploited, under-known, under-utilized under areas of herbal medicine, of natural medicine, of uh, foods. They have tremendous potential, as I hope you'll see during the course of the talk, to benefit our health in many different ways. So I hope during the course of this evening you'll find out a little bit about why I think that all mushrooms are magic. So, of course, mushrooms are magic because they taste fantastic. I mean, mushrooms are really, they should be part of everybody's diet. They should be part of everybody's um, culinary larder. And this is a selection. So that's the first reason why mushrooms are magic. I think they taste fantastic. Not only do they taste fantastic, but from a nutritional point of view, they also have an incredibly beneficial nutritional profile. They're low in calories. They're low in fats. They're also high in antioxidants, in fiber. They're high in certain vitamins, particularly the B vitamins, and also vitamin D. I mean, you might have heard that mushrooms are high in vitamin D. They're one of the only non-animal sources of vitamin D. However, one thing to be very careful with or to be aware of in that regard is they only develop, they only produce vitamin D on exposure to sunlight or to ultraviolet light. So if you're buying mushrooms in the supermarket that have been grown in the dark, they won't have high levels of vitamin D. But if you then put them on the kitchen windowsill, you know, even for half an hour you know, or an hour, they will then, the vitamin D levels will rise appreciably. So for all these reasons, mushrooms are very beneficial from a nutritional point of view. But it's not because of their nutritional content or because of their deliciousness that they're considered so highly in the classical Chinese herbal pharmacopoeia that is my own clinical heritage, if you like. This, is, this fellow you see there is supposedly the divine husbandsman who was the, is considered to be the founder of Chinese herbal medicine. It was considered that he gave the knowledge of the herbs to the Chinese people. And the first book on the Chinese Materia Medica is a book that was published on, was given his name the Divine Husbandsman's Materia Medica. And in that book already, they are listing a number of different mushrooms. And this is going back to the second century AD. So the Chinese have been using mushrooms for their health benefits for thousands of years. Which was quite a surprise to me, because growing up in this country, I, when I went for walks with my parents in the, in the forests, they would always say, don't touch the mushrooms. So I started out with a very negative attitude towards mushrooms. I started out to, to, with an association of mushrooms and ill health you know, of death, which is the complete opposite of the Chinese approach, where mushrooms are seen not only as preserving uh, health, but also conferring longevity. You know, as it said uh, here, if you eat mushrooms on a regular basis, they will lighten the body and confer longevity. So these are classified in the highest category of Chinese herbs, those herbs which you can safely take for long periods of time without adverse effects. So it's coming from that background that we're starting to look at the therapeutic benefits of mushrooms. Now, that's traditional knowledge, but over the last 50 years, there's also been an increasing body of modern scientific evidence which just confirms what the ancient Chinese texts have been telling us all along. This is an epidemiological study which was carried out in Japan on the population of the Nagano prefecture looking at the rate of cancer, cancer incidence among mushroom farmers compared to the general population and finding that the mushroom farmers actually had much lower rates of cancer than the general population. The assumption being that the mushroom farmers were eating more mushrooms. 
and this study has been confirmed, or two further studies, or non three further studies, looking specifically at the incidence of breast cancer in women and correlating that with their dietary consumption of mushrooms. And in all of these three studies, one Chinese study, two Korean studies, there is a strong correlation. The women who were eating mushrooms more often had lower rates of developing breast cancer. So again, that ability of mushrooms to confer longevity, to enhance our health and well-being, is very much present in these large-scale population studies. Now, those studies didn't break it down. They didn't look at which mushroom. They didn't say there's one mushroom rather than another mushroom. That ability of mushrooms to support our health, to preserve well-being, to help us to avoid developing cancer, wasn't a property of one mushroom or another mushroom. That was just generally eating mushrooms. And why is that? Actually, there are 650 different mushrooms, or extracts from 650 different mushrooms. They all show ability to influence the immune response. So it's not one mushroom or another mushroom. Sometimes you'll read in a magazine or you'll read in literature from one company or another company that it's this mushroom or that mushroom that you need to be taking if you're going to be, stay well, keep your immune system strong. And it's not. Every mushroom, to some degree or another, has the ability to support the immune system. And that's because, as part of their structure, mushrooms, in common with other fungi, have compounds in their cell walls. So the cell wall of every mushroom contains these compounds, these long chain molecules, which have been shown to interact with a number of receptors on the surface of major categories of cells in the immune system. So our immune system has the innate ability to recognize these compounds, which are structural components of all mushrooms, and respond to them with activation, with increased effectiveness in terms of the immune response against not only cancerous cells, but also against other uh, foreign cells, viral infections, bacterial infections, and parasites. So these compounds from mushroom cell walls help to potentiate our immune system's response to all of these different categories of pathogens all of these different threats. So it's not one mushroom or another mushroom. Not only do mushrooms help to support the immune system and the immune response, they also have been shown recently to have a prebiotic effect on our gut flora. We're increasingly understanding the importance of gut flora for our overall health and well-being, for our immune health, neurological health, etc. And these compounds as well as influencing the, our immune system, they also influence the balance, the makeup of the flora in our gut, with an increased proliferation of beneficial bacteria and an inhibition of harmful bacteria. So as well as supporting the immune system directly, they're also helping to promote a healthy, balanced gut microbiome. So when we talk about individual mushrooms, one of the main mushrooms that you may hear about in relation to cancer is this mushroom Coriolis. It's also one of the mushrooms that you will come across most commonly when you're out walking in the forests. Very common growing on rotting wood. Comes in a range of different colours. This one is grey-blue. Other ones go to more of a, uh, a reddish, brown, rust-coloured um, uh, uh, colouring. So a whole range of different mushrooms, but it all, they all have in common this concentric circles or design, which has given rise to its common name of turkey tail. So this is a very easy mushroom to find and recognize when you're out for your uh, walking in the woods, particularly in the autumn. And it's extracts from this mushroom which have been used in a lot of clinical studies in the Far East. These are studies which were carried out on stomach cancer in Japan, and all of these showing positive improvements in patient survival over two years, five years, 15 years. These are studies on other types of cancer, again, showing positive improvements. And one thing that's very important to point out at this point is that these studies 
these patients are not being given mushrooms on their own. Mushrooms on their own are not a treatment for cancer. Mushrooms are a supplement, they're a food that you can take to support your immune system that will enhance the body's ability to attack the cancer and also to resist some of the unwanted side effects from conventional treatment. So in all these cases, all of these studies, the patients are being given conventional treatment and then they've been given the mushrooms. And the patients are being divided into two groups, one group who have the mushroom supplements and one group who just have the conventional treatment. So in the groups giving the, taking the mushrooms, they, all, they show improvements in their survival over extended periods of time. And it's not just Coriolis, and all these, so all these studies with Coriolis have also been extensively researched. These, this is a study, MD Anderson Cancer Center is one of the leading cancer centers in America. So they carried out an, in, a, an exhaustive review of all of the clinical evidence looking at Coriolis, and they confirmed, or they concluded from that review, that it did indeed show positive promise for chemo prevention due to its multiple impacts on the malignant process. So you can read much more about it you know, online if you want to read the study. I think it's 15 pages long, the report. So um, there's a lot of good clinical evidence again. So not only are we dealing, when we're talking about mushrooms and their health benefits, we're not only talking about a category of natural supplements that have a long history of traditional use, have strong epidemiological evidence to support their benefits, but also have a significant body of clinical evidence, including a large number of randomized controlled trials, which is not often the case with natural supplements. So these are studies which were carried out on Coriolis. But again, and this is why, you know, Coriolis is also highly regarded in Chinese medicine. So these quotes from a famous Materia Medica in the 16th century, again talking about the ability of Coriolis when taken for a long period of time to confer longevity and well-being. But it's not just Coriolis again, none, it's never just the story of one mushroom rather than another mushroom. So a number of other mushrooms have also been researched. Shiitake is one that hopefully you're all enjoying uh, in your food called the fragrant mushroom in Chinese, Xiangu, because of its delicious flavor. And again, extracts from shiitake have been used clinically in Japan and in China, alongside conventional treatment, again with positive improvements in patient well-being, reduction in side effects from conventional treatment and improved treatment outcomes. Another mushroom with similar benefits in clinical studies is maitake. Maitake means dancing mushroom in Japanese. It is available here. It's a delicious culinary mushroom. It's not quite clear whether people called it a dancing mushroom because they danced for joy on finding it because it was going to be, it, could, uh, it was so beneficial for their health or because they could sell it for so much money. <laughs> But for whatever reason, the uh, benefits were appreciated. And again, it has been researched in relation to different types of cancer, showing positive improvements in treatment outcome. Another mushroom is the almond mushroom, which has also been researched with similar benefits. And reishi. Reishi, you again will probably have heard of as the quintessential Chinese mushroom. And we'll talk about that more later in the course of the evening. But in all these cases, they have shown positive improvements. Patients undergoing conventional treatment, taking these mushroom supplements, have fewer side effects, have less um, adverse events in terms of making them having to stop the conventional treatment because of reduction in white blood cell counts, etc. So they help to support the patients during the conventional treatment. And when those patients are followed over a period of time, they appear to do better. They have better treatment outcomes. But again, in none of these cases are they being done, taken on their own. 
So they're not a treatment, they're just a support for patients. And that's really how they should be used. It's how they're used in the Far East. It's how they're used also by some leading integrative oncology centers. This is one I work with closely, which happens to be in Turkey. And they use mushrooms alongside their treatment for that specific purpose of supporting the immune system. And the benefit, the good thing in, about them in that regard is they can be taken very safely alongside the conventional chemotherapeutic agents, alongside radiotherapy, etc. So there are very few side effects. The Lancet reviewed one of the studies carried out in Japan, meticulously went through every one of the patient records and they found no incidents of adverse events during that study. So we've talked about the use of these compounds, the role of these compounds, these mushroom cell wall long chain molecules in cancer, but that's not their only benefit for the body, that's the, not the only reason why they are so important. They have a number of other different functions. Because they support the immune system, they don't just support the immune system response to cancer, they also support the immune system's response to viral infections, to bacterial infections, and also to fungal infections. Now, many people often come up to me and they say, well, shouldn't, if I have candida, shouldn't I not eat mushrooms? There is absolutely no reason why you should not eat mushrooms if you have a fungal condition. Quite the opposite. The things which you shouldn't eat in particular are sugar. You know, sugar is a very strong facilitator or promoter of fungal, of candidal growth. Mushrooms don't contain sugar. They're not sweet, you know, when you eat them. Not only do they not contain the compounds which help to promote fungal growth, they also, through their ability to support the immune system's response, they also support the immune system's response to those fungal infections. And so clinically are a very useful part of treatment protocols for those conditions, as well as supporting the immune system's response to fungal infections I'll mention uh, later on some of the compounds which they produce which have direct antifungal activity. So mushrooms are not out there helping other mushrooms, other fungi grow in the wild. They're out there actively competing for resources. And in that battle for survival, the struggle of the fittest, survival of the fittest, they have produced, evolved to produce a vast array of antimicrobial compounds many of which are antifungal. So they don't contain sugar, they do support the immune system's response to fungal infections, and in many cases they contain fung compounds with direct antifungal activity. So these are also useful areas for benefit from mushroom supplementation or including mushrooms in your diet. As well as that, they've also been shown to have a beneficial effect on uh, cholesterol, control and also on blood sugar control. So in studies, mainly animal studies in relation to cholesterol and uh, blood sugar, mushroom consumption shows beneficial uh, effects in improving those. One, uh, in terms of viral conditions, one viral condition which has been extensively researched in people is HPV. Because in HPV, many women with HPV infection can go on to develop cervical dysplasia. As a pre-stage, the cells of the cervix start to become abnormal or show yeah, abnormalities. And that's a precancerous stage. And it's a stage at which the conventional Western approach is not to treat, it's to just monitor. They just wait and see. You know, is the person going to be able to effectively clear it themselves or is the condition going to progress? Is the abnormality going to progress to more severe precancerous stages? So during that phase, while there is no Western treatment offered, it's an ideal time for women to take some form of supplementation to reinforce, to support their immune system's ability to clear the cancer. And there have been a number of studies which have confirmed that mushroom supplementation has a dramatic improve, it has a dramatic effect, dramatic increase in 
the clearance of both the viral infection, the high-risk HPV strains, together with the cervical, the abnormal cells of the cervix. So in three studies, there are three, I think I've quoted uh, two studies here, but there have been three studies at least which have looked specifically at this using different mushrooms or using combinations of mushroom. And in all studies, you see a significant improvement. The first study, you know, which looks, which says uh, there was 90% uh, also 88% clearance compared to 5% in the control group. And the second one, you know, with similar uh, improvements in the clearance of the high-risk strains and also in the ability to return the, the cells in the cervix to a normal condition. Normally women can do that if you have a healthy young woman who has a early stage cervical dysplasia, you know, after about six months, a year, 50% of the cases the cells will have returned to a healthy state. But in this case, we're talking closer to 100% of women, 90% of those women will show normal cell cytology after six months to a year. You know, and this is supported by clinical reports, clinical cases. You know, in many cases, it's clear that that ability to support the immune system is uh, very appropriate. So really, any woman in that condition, I would say, should be taking mushrooms whether it's Coriolis, whether it's Reishi, whether it's Shiitake was another study. Just eating more mushrooms, taking more mushroom supplements. Another uh, condition where mushroom polysaccharides, these compounds from mushrooms show benefit is actually in PCOS, which is interesting because PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, is a condition which is, shows, is related to uh, blood sugar uh, to insulin insensitivity. So there are hormonal issues with insulin control which are related to PCOS and because mushrooms help to control blood sugar, it's maybe not surprising they also show benefit for PCOS. This was one study which looked at women who were not ovulating. You know, in many women with, P with PCOS, with polycystic ovaries, they fail to ovulate or they stop ovulating. So in, these, in this study, they looked at these women, gave them maitake, and they found that 70, yeah, almost 70, 75% of those women were able to ovulate successfully with the maitake. They also found that the women who had been unable to ovulate with the first-line conventional medical treatment of clomiphene citrate, all of the women given clomiphene citrate who didn't ovulate successfully, when they were given maitake alongside the clomiphene citrate, they all ovulated successfully. So again, you know, another very important area uh, where these compounds from mushrooms show beneficial effects. So these compounds, as I've said, are present in all mushrooms. However, they're not the only category of active compound from mushroom, from mushrooms. Mushrooms also, as well as having these structural components, have evolved to produce a wide variety of other active compounds to the extent that they've been called nature's biofactories. In many cases, these compounds are antimicrobial. And it's not surprising that all of, uh, most of the major anti Biotics that are used in Western medicine come from fungi, you know, related to mushrooms. Also, other compounds like statins. People, you may not know, statins, of course, are prescribed extensively to reduce cholesterol levels. However, the first group to isolate lovastatin, the first statin, which was a group based in London, they didn't talk about its role in cholesterol metabolism. They talked about the antifungal properties of lovastatin because that is why the mushrooms produce it. The mushrooms are another fungi. They don't produce it because it has an impact on cholesterol metabolism. They produce it because it has antifungal activity and it helps them to compete with other fungi, with other mushrooms for resources. So, Mushrooms produce a wide variety of secondary metabolites which have largely antimicrobial properties. 
This is lovastatin. It's not just found in the other fungi that it was produced, it's also found in many mushrooms. And it's because of these secondary metabolites, it's because of these compounds which uh, the mushrooms are producing for antimicrobial properties, in many cases also have physiological effect, like the impact on cholesterol. So lovastatin is produced because of its antifungal properties, but it also has an impact on cholesterol metabolism. So because our body shares a lot of chemistry in common with mushrooms, we are more closely related to mushrooms and other fungi than we are to plants, for instance. When we look at DNA and evolution, we find that plants diverged from fungi and animals much further back on the evolutionary tree than fungi and animals diverged. So we share a lot more chemistry in common with mushrooms than we do with plants, for instance. So it's not surprising that some of these compounds produced by mushrooms for their antifungal properties, antimicrobial properties, also have impact on our own internal cellular chemistry. So when we come to look at some of the most important medicinal mushrooms, we find that it's not just because of their ability to support our immune system that they have this diverse array of properties. It's also because of these other compounds that they produce. So reishi, the quintessential Chinese mushroom, the mushroom of immortality in Chinese legend, the mushroom which is shown here embroidered into the ceremonial robes of the Chinese emperors or carved onto uh, fans onto screens in the Chinese palaces. The reason why this mushroom was so revered was not just because it supported the immune system, but also because it possessed a diverse array of other properties. And these properties are down to these secondary compounds. So reishi, as well as supporting the immune system, also shows anti-inflammatory properties. It also shows antihistamine properties. It also has sedative effect. It is antihypertensive. So all of these properties give it that incredible uh, uh, therapeutic breadth, if you like and width, and makes it uh, the, uh, the number one mushroom, certainly in China, you know, for people from all perspectives, both for longevity, for you know, even for cancer, you know, often reishi would be the number one mushroom that people would tend to take because it's not just supporting the immune system, it's also having anti-inflammatory action, it's also directly impairing the ability of the cancer cells to uh, proliferate, to develop and to spread. In terms of this time of year, when one of the most important conditions or most common conditions is hay fever, this is the mushroom for hay fever. I mean, this is the mushroom which uh, certainly from my clinical practice has replaced all Chinese <laughs> herbs, all Chinese formulae. In Chinese medicine, we have a, a way of looking at the action of treatment of conditions where we talk about the manifestation of the condition, we talk about the symptoms the person's experiencing, and then the reason, the underlying cause. We talk about the root and the manifestation. So in terms of hay fever, the symptoms are inflammation, they're inflammatory. You get red eyes, you get itchy sore throats, you get mucus, overproduction of mucus, etc. Caused by localized inflammation in the mucous membranes. But the reason for that inflammation is because the immune system is overreacting. You know, it's oversensitive to pollen, to whatever other environmental factors are precipitating the hay fever. And reishi the beauty of reishi for hay fever is that it actively targets both of those. So it actively helps to support a healthy immune response as well as having antihistamine activity, reducing histamine levels in the mucous membranes in the tissues and having anti-inflammatory action. So it both treats the root of the condition and it treats the manifestation of the condition. So it's a, it's a wonderful one, um, one pill to treat hay fever. Not only does it help to treat hay fever during the acute period, acute episode, it also helps to prevent it when it is taken on an ongoing period of time. 
So often patients, they come with acute hay fever, you know, so acute inflammation, itchy, sore, dry eyes, etc. So reishi will help to calm that down. And then if they continue to take reishi, particularly you know, during, the, during the winter, early spring, before their symptoms would normally appear, their symptoms then don't appear or are much milder when they do appear because the immune system has been strengthened, the immune system has been rebalanced. Probably not correct to use the word strengthened because it is about rebalancing the immune system. It's about helping a underactive immune system deal with infections. It's also about down-regulating overactive immune responses as in hay fever. So reishi is a fantastic uh, mushroom for that. The fact that it is also a sedative, has sedative action is, again, a really useful secondary property of this. Often people taking reishi, they come back and they will say, I just sleep much better. And you know, most of us could do with sleeping much better <laughs> some of the time. So reishi's sedative properties are also uh, very important. Um, and also, as well as being uh, helping people to sleep, it also helps with anxiety. So people you know, who have a nervous disposition, it also helps to calm that down, has anxiolytic effect. So it really is a, a very broad in its therapeutic application. And these properties, again, are due to these other compounds in the mushroom, not these long chain molecules, these triterpenes, they're called and it's they that have this sedative antihistamine, anti-inflammatory properties. And makes it a fantastic mushroom for hay fever and also other autoimmune conditions. Those autoimmune conditions again caused by imbalanced immune response with inflammatory processes, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, even psoriasis. So I've seen people with psoriasis benefit you know, from taking reishi. Again, an autoimmune condition. So reishi is a very useful mushroom for a lot of these different conditions. Another mushroom which is highly revered in China, if any of you has had a, have had a chance to go to China, have been to any Chinese herb shops, you'll find that on the walls they have these wonderful displays of this mushroom, this mushroom cordyceps, which are really there for, uh, as gifts, you know, they're not really designed for therapeutic application because it's so highly regarded and gift-giving gift is such a major part of Chinese culture, then this is a particularly precious and particularly highly regarded gift. So cordyceps uh, you know, is almost second to reishi in that regard. When you look at the picture, it is a little bit different from the other mushrooms because this is a mushroom which doesn't grow naturally on decaying wood or out of the soil. It actually grows as a parasite on the larvae of other insects, of moths. And there have been a number of nature programs recently, which you may have seen, with species of cordyceps, not this one, other there are over 700 species of cordyceps. And they infect the insects and you know, the insect, um, they take over the insect effectively. And then they produce their uh, spore-bearing tube to spread their spores, their seeds, to uh, colonize other unsuspecting hosts. So this is a mushroom which is harvested on the Tibetan plateau. It grows above 3,000 meters in the grasslands. It's collected early in the spring before the grass has started to grow, which makes it hard to find. And you know, that's how it's sold. Luckily, we don't have to buy it like that now. Luckily, it has been cultivated, or variants of it have been cultivated successfully. So if you're going to go into the health food store and you're buying cordyceps as a supplement, it won't have been harvested in Tibet. It won't have been grown on the Tibetan plateau. You won't be eating insect larvae with your cordyceps supplement. It's a mushroom which traditionally is considered to, as a tonic, it's considered to strengthen the body, particularly used as a fertility tonic you know, for men to improve sexual performance. Also for women, it's been shown to increase libido and also it increases steroid hormone production. 
So it's been shown to boost levels of testosterone. It's also been shown to boost levels of estrogen. And for that reason, it's a mushroom I tend not to advise people to take if they have hormone-dependent cancers. You know, if you have breast cancer, prostate cancer, cordyceps isn't really advisable because of its, the fact that it does promote steroid hormone formation. It increases levels of these hormones that then potentiate the development of those cancers. However, if for a lot of cases, you know, women, men dealing, women dealing with infertility, men, de men dealing with low sperm count, poor sperm quality, there are a number of studies, again, which show beneficial improvements from taking cordyceps in those cases. As well as that, it was traditionally used to treat uh, lung conditions, to treat asthma, and it's a very useful supplement uh, for strengthening lungs in those cases. COPD, um, as well in horses, interestingly enough, there's been some positive studies in that regard. And for people who are uh, just weak and recovering after long illness. So it's really, of all the medicinal mushrooms, it's the one that has the strongest tonification properties. It also is very beneficial for anti-stress, for supporting the heart, and also for protecting the liver. That aspect of protecting the liver, though, is not something that's unique to cordyceps. Reishi you know, also will do that. But cordyceps um, you know, is really to support, to strengthen. It will also help to support the immune system, of course, but you know, that's something that all mushrooms do. It's also the mushroom that's responsible for this headline. A, few, uh, a couple of years ago in the Daily Express, which was the only time I think that I've bought the Daily Express. <laughs> and I got very excited because I thought, you know, there was a mushroom here, they found some cure for arthritis, wonderful. But unfortunately, when you read the research, when you read the study, when you read the article, it is, the article is because Arthritis Research UK had given a grant of £250,000 to a group of researchers at Nottingham University to investigate the potential of a compound from cordyceps in the treatment of arthritis. So somehow the journalists had got from that to a front page headline of mushroom cure for arthritis. Maybe, maybe one day, but uh, unfortunately not yet. What, of course, is interesting, though, is that, again, this is another category of compound in mushrooms which is responsible. So it's this compound, you know, cordycepin, which is the one which has been researched in relation to arthritis. So it's just another example of a diverse array of other compounds produced in mushrooms. Another reason, if you like, why they are so magic in their range of um, active properties. Another mushroom which is, I think, a really useful clinical mushroom, a really beneficial uh, culinary mushroom, is lion's mane. It does grow in this country. Unfortunately, it's not easy to find, um, although there are some growers in this country now growing it. So if you're lucky, you can find it uh, probably not, I'm not sure where in Brighton, in London, there are, there are shops, there are farmers markets which stock it. If, anybody, if any of you is interested, I'll give you my email address at the end and, and I can tell you where to get it from in a fresh form. So lion's mane is a delicious culinary mushroom. But again, as well as having beneficial effects immunologically, it shows some really useful secondary effects due to the other compounds it produces. Specifically, these compounds have been shown to promote the generation of nerve growth factors. Nerve growth factors are compounds found in the brain, in other nervous tissue, in other cells in the body, which promote cellular repair and regeneration, specifically nerve repair and regeneration. So, as you can imagine, the ability of a mushroom to promote nerve repair and regeneration is particularly interesting today with an increasing proliferation of neurodegenerative conditions. I'm thinking dementia, Alzheimer's, etc., but also conditions like multiple sclerosis. So in all these cases, there are grounds for 
believing that supplementation with lion's mane can at least slow the development and in some cases reverse the condition in dementia, in Alzheimer's, in multiple sclerosis. There have been a number of clinical studies. This is uh, one Japanese study looking at lion's mane in elderly patients with mild cognitive impairment and again showing that supplementation taken over 12 weeks was able to show improvements in function in their independence, the improvements in their ability to perform normal tasks. This was another small study again using lion's mane as a dietary component, in this case just adding it into soup and showing positive improvements in their ability to carry out normal tasks. There have also been studies looking at the impact of lion's mane on nerve myelination and clinically it often shows benefits in terms of multiple sclerosis. Unfortunately in all of these cases these are not conditions which lion's mane is able to permanently reverse. What it is able to do is slow or temporarily reverse the condition and as long as the consumption of lion's mane is maintained, is continued, that improvement is continued. But when people stop taking the lion's mane, often you start to see a deterioration of the symptoms. They haven't reversed the underlying process that's involved in the destruction of the nerve cells, but they are helping to um, maintain a level of function which is better than it would be otherwise. And in, certainly in some cases of multiple sclerosis I've seen reversal of the symptoms. So where people had got loss of sensation, uh, loss of control, that's come back to a degree. So again, these are not magic cures, but they're definitely culinary components, they're definitely things that people can take to help to manage the symptoms, manage the condition more effectively. As well as helping to promote nerve repair and regeneration, these compounds in lion's mane also have sedative action. They also have calming action. So again, it has helped, is very beneficial for anxiety, for depression, for sleep. One interesting area that I had never thought about or would never have thought about is its use in menopause. If you look in any of the books, any of the literature, even the larger book that I wrote, it doesn't talk about the role of lion's mane in menopause. But I had a phone call one day from a colleague of mine in North London who had a couple of his wife and another, another patient who he was given lion's mane to for nerve damage and they both independently said their hot flushes had stopped. So, you know, I thought that was interesting and it was even more interesting when a few days later another colleague of mine said exactly the same thing. Two patients who he'd been giving lion's mane to for nerve damage had again reported that their hot flushes had cleared up. So then I started giving lion's mane to women with menopause-related symptoms, hot flushes, particularly for difficulty sleeping. And you know, in almost every case, the women found a significant improvement in their symptoms from taking lion's mane. So, you know, again, it's a culinary mushroom which is incredibly useful for promoting overall health and well-being. And these mushrooms which have these unique properties though, they also have immune modulating properties. So if you're going to be eating mushrooms, you're going to be taking mushroom supplements as well as having benefits for nerve damage, for neurodegenerative conditions, you're also going to be supporting the immune system. I don't want you to think also that it's only these special mushrooms, it's only reishi, cordyceps, lion's mane. The message from this evening is not that these, you have to take these special mushrooms. Any mushroom that you take is going to be beneficial. Shiitake, you know, this one of the most common culinary mushrooms, you know, even that taken over a period of time by young adults 
led to, significant, led to improvements in their immune function. So this is just culinary, dietary consumption. Typically, regular consumption is defined as three or four times a week, you know, having a portion of mushrooms three or four times a week. One thing that's important to be aware of with shiitake is that, though, is that it is important to cook it. I would actually say cook all mushrooms because it helps to disrupt the cellular structure, it helps to release some of the compounds from the cell wall of the mushrooms. But in the, in the case of shiitake, there are compounds which are toxic, which are broken down by cooking. So there is a condition called shiitake dermatitis, which as its name suggests is a skin rash which develops on people eating a lot of shiitake. It's quite a lot of shiitake people have to eat. But in every case, in every report, it is always raw shiitake. So cooked shiitake is absolutely fine. So I would always say cook your mushrooms. Another culinary mushroom, which is one of my favorite mushrooms, is snow fungus. You probably won't recognize this particular picture because that's what it looks like in the wild. When you see it on the shelves of a Chinese supermarket, it looks a little bit different, but I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later. And this wonderful mushroom, it's called snow fungus often in, uh, in the West, is one which has again been used for thousands of years in Chinese culture. It's used in Chinese cookery um, quite extensively in soups. And it has some wonderful properties. So it helps to support the immune system, but also it helps to support the nervous system. And it's considered to uh, enhance beauty. So it's a particularly useful mushroom. Yeah, I used to be uh, skeptical about that too. <laughs> I used to think that, yeah, I took that with a very large pinch of salt. And it wasn't until one lady who you know, I'd given lion's mane to for another reason came back and said, look, the condition's cleared up, but can I keep taking the lion's mane because my skin is so much better? She had dry skin with sort of red, you know, sort of, you know, inflammation, dry, red, slightly irritated skin. And her skin, the dryness had cleared up, the sort of red inflammation had cleared up. I mean, she was very happy. And since then, I've given it to other women. And again, it has a, a consistent ability, particularly in eld, older women with dryness, you know, uh, redness in the skin. It improves skin quality. So it does truly have an ability to enhance beauty. And we now know that that ability to enhance beauty, A, partly is because it has anti-inflammatory properties but it also increases microcirculation to the skin. So snow fungus is, is able to enhance, support the health of the wall, cells lining the walls of our blood vessels. So the veins, the capillaries. So we're able to prevent damage, which prevents damage to these uh, blood vessel uh, components and also to enhance circulation. So it has mild anticoagulant properties, enhances circulation, improves microcirculation to the skin, is anti-inflammatory, and also has a beneficial impact on, bra on brain function as well. So this is definitely on my uh, daily consumption list of mushrooms, because <laughs> it has so many beneficial effects. So reishi I take every day, and snow fungus, you know, in case you want to, uh, you want to know. And as I said, it's not that translucent um, appearance. This is uh, what it looks like when you buy it in the Chinese supermarket. It is this uh, very hard, crispy, uh, slightly off-white coloured um, mushroom. And, but it rehydrates. You put it into water and it just rehydrates fully. So it's just purely you know, polysaccharides. So you can probably get it in Chinese supermarkets here in Brighton, I would imagine. So I would say, yeah, definitely try and include that in your cooking. I mean, that's just me holding some of it when it's growing you know, in China. Again, they don't, they, they don't uh, go out and harvest it in the wild. Some mushrooms are still harvested in the wild in China. Most of them are grown you know, in these big uh, warehouses if you like, under controlled conditions and then dried and 
uh, transported. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely one to look out for. So, do all um, get down to your local mushroom store. Unfortunately, we don't have any like that here in Brighton, not yet. It's in San Francisco. <laughs> but uh, far west fungi. So it's a store dedicated to, uh, to, to selling mushrooms. If you want to find out more about any of the mushrooms that I've mentioned today or about mushrooms in general, as Peter mentioned, I've written a couple of books. You know, the clinical guide has a lot more in-depth information. It has all the research. It has the Latin names. The essential guide is much more accessible much more straightforward, doesn't have so much research, deals with the common names. So both of those have um, a lot of background information. And I'm also always happy to answer questions. Generally, most culinary mushrooms, no. So shiitake, you know, as long as it's cooked, no. I mean, you could have a whole meal of shiitake you know, and you'd be fine. Uh, snow fungus, you know, absolutely fine. Lion's mane. Lion's mane, because it has sedative properties, you know, as well, I wouldn't... And the sedative properties in lion's mane are because some of the compounds interact with opioid receptors in the brain. Right. So going back to that thing, that picture at the front, the mushroom, magic mushrooms. Yes, mushrooms, as well as producing compounds which have impact on the immune system, have anti-inflammatory. Many of these compounds also can have impact on nervous function. Mm. And that's the reason why we have magic mushrooms. And my compounds from lion's mane also have that property. So I wouldn't have a lot of lion's mane. Um, I wouldn't have a lot of reishi also for the, yeah. same, for the same reason. Reishi is also a little bit harder to digest. It's not a culinary mushroom. So mushrooms like lion's mane, which are used in food, you know, uh, I, I, and snow fungus, shiitake, maitake. Again, you could eat maitake till the cows come home and you'd be fine. Reishi I'd be more careful with. Also, reishi has anticoagulant properties. So again, caution on reishi if you're taking blood thinners, for instance. Um, cordyceps. Yes, again, you won't be taking that in huge quantities. So the culinary mushrooms, you're fine. What about Coriolis? Coriolis, no adverse effect reported uh, with Coriolis, as far as I'm aware. It's not, typically a, a, it's not typically a culinary mushroom, but it's not a mushroom which produces any compounds which would be expected to have adverse effects taken over a long period of time oh. or at high dose. So I think you'd be okay. I mean, the thing, with, the thing with dosage is it always is so specific to the individual yeah. and their condition. So it's very hard to give generalized guidelines. Mm -hmm. However, it tries to give a kind of you know, broad spectrum in you know, a ballpark figure yeah. you know, that you can work with. Yeah. Yes, it is a very confusing uh, marketplace out there, uh, absolutely. And I mean, that's, you know, I, 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 for, the, for this reason, I ended up producing my own you know, uh, as well. So, you know, I. The follow up question was any advice about um, harvesting, uh, say, turkey tail in the wild and how to get the most out of it? Turkey tail in the wild, because it's, because it's a seasonal mushroom, it can be dehydrated. You know, quite easily, and it can be kept then for an extended period of time. So it can either be frozen or it can be dehydrated, and then you can you can keep it and preserve it. Some people will also make it. You know, if you're a herbalist, you might also make an extract or make a tincture out of it and preserve it that way. So there are different ways to do it. So like whenever you see it, take get it, <laughs> and then there are different ways. So either dehydration, freezing, or tincturing you know, or making an extract, either of those ways. In terms of, in terms of uh, the, the, the products out there, you know, going back uh, to that, the first thing I would 
say is there are two main, there are three main categories of raw material used in mushroom supplements. And this is going to be a little bit technical, but you know, I'll, so it's, it's re reading the label is the first thing. Um, and secondly, is ignoring whatever the label says. <laughs> as far as the uh, contents, the constituents, or the concentration ratio. So, you know, if it says it's 20 to 1, it's not, unfortunately. Um, I mean, this is a, you know, a, this is a, I, I, that's why I'm in China, I go to China. The, 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 the brand that I, I put together was my, is sold under the Myconutri brand. There's a, there's a, the, one? Myconutri, M-Y-C-O Nutri, N-U-T-R-I. <laughs> They're mainly, a, you have to look online, there's a website, mushroomnutrition.com. There are three main types, you know, before I said, yes, ignore everything on the label. As far as the concentration ratio or percentages of constituents, that's another story. But um, yes, there are three main types. So the fruiting body is what you're seeing, you know, when you're normally harvesting a mushroom. Secondly, there are extracts which are usually, but not exclusively, made from the fruiting body. And an extract is just a way of concentrating some of the compounds from that. And there are two types of extract, hot water extracts and ethanolic extracts, alcohol extracts. Ethano hot water extracts will extract more of the immu immune modulating polysaccharides uh, compounds. Ethanolic extracts will extract more of the anti-inflammatory compounds, you could say, you know, just to keep it very simple. So there are extracts, and then there's what's called mycelial biomass, or full spectrum um, products. So a major range of products which is produced almost exclusively with those is OM mushrooms. So you see these packets, OM uh, mushrooms, and that's mycelial biomass. What mycelial biomass is, is a grain-based substrate, which is usually brown rice, but in the case of on mushrooms is corn, uh, maize, which is then inoculated with the mushroom mycelium. The mycelium grows to fully colonize the substrate, and then the whole mass is harvested. They don't separate out the grain from the mushroom mycelium. The whole mass is dried, powdered, and harvested. That has the advantage that it captures secondary metabolites, the antimicrobial compounds, because they tend to be secreted into the substrate on which the mushroom is growing. So you get higher concentrations of those, but you get lower concentrations of the mushroom cell wall components, if you like. So it has advantages and disadvantages. But be aware, when you're buying a, comp a product with mycelial biomass, you're probably getting up to 50% grain, you know, or grain, or, 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 or it's like fermented grain. You know, think of it as a fermented food. So it's, it's really interesting, it's a very rich material, but it's not all mushroom. So generally, for, particularly for cancer, I prefer extracts. So I would tend to use higher concentrations because I want the highest concentration of the immune modulating compounds, the anti-inflammatory compounds, the anti-cancer compounds from the mushrooms. And all of the clinical evidence also is derived from extracts in relation to mushrooms. So I tend to like those as a health supplement generally. You know, the biomass, you know, with that full spectrum activity also has a role to play. Uh, but it's very much, it's hard, it's a really difficult um, one for the lay person to judge. But just be aware, look at what's on the label, look at what the components are. The, the, the fruiting body itself, the fruiting body does have a lot of benefits, there's no doubt. Fruiting bodies have high levels of the immune modulating compounds themselves. So in many ways, if you're looking at it from a that's why I encourage people to eat more mushrooms, <laughs> always, you know, rather than necessarily taking them as supplement. But if you, if you have a con condition, then I think extracts are, in most cases, the my, my preferred way to go. So I would, I, I, I would stick to organic yeah. supplements.
because e even though organic cultivation in China is not <laughs> is not as um, <laughs> carefully controlled, shall we say, as uh, it is in the UK or in the EU. However, for the organic export, every batch has to be independently tested of the material. So in term, if you're buying uh, an organically certified product, as even if the origin is from China, you can be sure that it has been independently tested for heavy metals and pesticide residues. So, yes, for stuff that's not organically, I, I, I wouldn't touch stuff from China generally if it wasn't organically tested. I, do, I, don't, I don't think you have another choice, effectively, you know, unless you can grow it yourself. And I think the risks are very uh, low in the majority uh, of cases. The heavy, met the, the heavy metal levels from you know, being involved in the production side of the industry, often it's the wild harvested material that's worse than the cultivated. Yeah, truffles are mushrooms. I mean, truffles, so they have their cell wall components again. But the thing is, you're going to have to eat a lot of them. So unless you've got deep pockets, <laughs> you're probably better off having a, finding a cheaper mushroom to take to support the immune system. Truffles do have other interesting properties, of course, uh, as well. But generally, they are too expensive to consume in the type of quantity on a regular basis that you would want to from a clinical perspective. But yes, if, you, if you've got truffles, absolutely have, enjoy them. Well, in some cases, there are some compounds, the sort of flavor compounds, which you know, obviously it does, you do lose to some extent. But most mushroom, most of the compounds are not volatile. They, they, particularly the immune modulating compounds, these cell wall components, yeah. they're still there, you know, when it's been dried and kept for 10 years. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Uh, you know, it doesn't actually go. <laughs> and a lot of mushrooms do rehydrate, you know, really like shiitake, for instance, yeah. I mean, it rehydrates and it's still quite tasty. It's, it's, it's not quite the same. So yes, yeah, some, some of the more volatile, some of the second, smaller compounds, smaller molecules, you probably will lose. But most of the important, most of the clinically important compounds will still be there in the mushrooms. No, I, th I think they're tremendous, the, the, the research is tremendously exciting. And I look forward to the day that we can use them here in this country as well. Uh, but for now, their, their status uh, here doesn't permit us to use them. Um, certainly clinically. Who is in your, in your oh, to totally. I, I think they're, they're very important, potentially very important uh, area, for a very important um, area of clinical use for mushrooms. And it's a shame that more research hasn't been done. There's always going to be a problem with standardization, you know, when you're, when you're actually harvesting, because you know, there you're not sure to some extent, A, you know, people have got to pick the right species. I mean, in the case of psilocybin, it's relatively easy. But also the, concent the, the, the concentration of the psilocybin, you know, is going to vary significantly. So the potential for adverse reactions is, you know, relatively high. So it's not something that I would recommend people went out and started doing. But I think, you know, in a controlled environment, the uh, research is, is very exciting. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.